Julia is a senior reporter at ProPublica. From 2000 to 2013, she was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal where she led a privacy investigative team that was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize in explanatory, explanatory reporting in 2011. In 2014, Julia was named Reporter of the Year by News Women's Club of New York. In 2003, she was on a team of reporters at the Wall Street Journal that was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in explanatory reporting for coverage of corporate corruption. Recently, she has explored the impact of algorithms on our daily lives for ProPublica, including the use of the criminal, risk, uh, criminal justice risk assessment tool, Compass, made by North Point. Without further ado, Julia Angwin. It's great to be here, and um, I, um, I just want you to know I'm Jewish, I'm supposed to be fasting, but I feel like this is a form of worship, <laughs> talking about uh, something I'm so passionate about, which is the investigation we recently did into criminal risk scores. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about the investigation that we recently did at ProPublica. Um, basically, I have been a tech reporter most of my life, writing about tech companies and um, not an expert on criminal justice. But as I wrote more and more about the use of personal data in our lives, it occurred to me that some of the highest stakes usage of these this type of data is in the criminal justice system. I think we're all familiar with the algorithm that adjusts your news feed in Facebook and the controversies of whether it's too conservative or too liberal or whether it's making the right choices for you. But the truth about that algorithm is that you can always go find that news if you want to, right? So you're not being foreclosed from options. If you want to see what's on conservative news sites, you can go to them. And so as I was sort of thinking through the issues of the world of the personal data economy that I cover, it occurred to me that a much more high stakes use of personal data is these risk of recidivism algorithms. Can you see these things with the light? I guess sort of vaguely. Well, it's just sort of directionally. <laughs> um, so this is, um, so you, you guys are all familiar with uh, criminal risk scores. They're used throughout the nation. Um, to determine you know, your risk. And often it's a risk of recidivism, sometimes it's risk of substance abuse and other things. And so I stumbled on this as a non-criminal justice person and thought this is the highest stakes algorithm I've seen and I would like to investigate it. Um, so uh, I looked at Compass because it was used nationwide. Um, it's by, made by North Point. Most of you probably are familiar with it. How many people are familiar with it? Okay, most people. So good, I'm talking to a highly literate audience. Sometimes I have to explain what this is. Most recently, I gave a talk where everyone in the room knew their own Compass score, because I gave a talk at San Quentin two weeks ago in the prison university there, and it was incredible, because as you probably know, uh, Compass is used to sort you within the corrections department of the prison system in California. And so for these people, being judged low risk was how they got into San Quentin, which has a university project. And so it was the first time I was in a room with everyone's like, I'm a one, I'm a two. <laughs> um, so anyways, uh, Compass, um, as you probably know, is used at all, a lot of different stages of um, the criminal justice system. It can be used pretrial, it can be used at sentencing, it can be used at parole. Um, it, in sentencing in particular is what I thought was most um, questionable uh, because of the issue with getting punished more for something that is in the future, which is your future recidivism. Um, so I was looking at Wisconsin, California, and New York, which all use Compass at sentencing. And uh, this little drawing on the right just is amusing to me. It's the Wisconsin um, has a drawing of where Compass is used in their correction system, and they actually use it, all the orange boxes are, are Compass, and basically they use it at every stage, and also, so at arrest, at conviction, at parole, and within, you know, the, when you're in the correction system, sorting you into different um, risk levels in prison, and um, they call the, there was a video that I uh, watched where they call this the giant pinball machine, of corrections in Wisconsin, with Compass being the lever that sorts you at every stage. Um, so as I started to stumble into criminal justice, where I'm not an expert, I, um, I looked at um, Eric Holder's question that he raised in 2014, where he asked, do these criminal risk scores, which he wrote, said were crafted with the best of intentions, are they actually exacerbating the disparities that are already so endemic to our criminal justice system? 
And at that time, he asked the U.S. Sentencing Commission to do a study of racial bias in the use of risk scores at sentencing. But they didn't do that. They did a very um, comprehensive study of recidivism that um, was taking all their time. And so when I saw that call and this high stakes algorithm and the fact that there weren't many independent studies of these scores, I decided to do one myself. Um, and just uh, the first thing that I looked for was what is the score? Like what is it made out of? Um, it turns out you may have all, who has seen the Compass Questionnaire? Some people, but it wasn't, it was hard to find. I had to get someone to leak it to me because it's actually not public. So um, it's posted on our website, but it has a lot of questions you can't see here, but like about your residence stability, you know, is your, do you ever come from a crime ridden neighborhood or your family been, uh, anyone in your family been arrested? Um, and there's all sorts of questions. Um, Harper's actually took some of the questions and made them into a poem. So I don't know if you can see this, but basically there's a section of the questionnaire that is about agree, disagree with a bunch of statements. And the statements are, I feel unhappy at times. I feel discouraged at times. I've never felt sad about things in my life. And it's just a, a series of agree, disagree with these types of statements. And you know, this is an algorithm that we don't know how it's weighted. So I don't know what happens when you say yes or no to these questions, how it affects your score. Um, but in the end, what happens after you ask, answer all these questions is you get scored. And this is what a compass risk score looks like. The reds are risk of violence, risk of recidivism, risk of failure to appear, um, and risk of con continuing non-compliance. And then the greens are the needs assessments. So if you all are familiar with the difference between the risk and the needs assessment, how many? No? Okay, so basically the needs assessment is sp supposed to be a separate type of thing, which is like, do you need substance abuse counseling? Do you need cognitive behavioral therapy? Do you need vocational job training? Do you need a stable home? And so the green scores are about your needs. And the red scores are about like your risks in terms of violence, recidivism, and flight. Um, and I guess non-compliance being bad behavior. So, um, so I went around thinking, okay, I wanna find a data set to look at, because that's how I like to, to roll. And so um, I really wanted how these scores were used in sentencing. But as you may all know, the pre-sentencing investigations, which contain these scores, are sealed in every state. And so I wasn't able to get the scores that were actually used during a sentencing because I needed, I wanted to analyze a large data set. So I went to a pretrial um, jurisdiction. So Broward County uses the compass at pretrial. And, um, and they also have great open records laws. So um, that's why a lot of investigative journalism takes place in Florida. Um, and uh, so I filed a FOIA last year in April and um, actually uh, it took five months of legal battling to get the data, but we did get it. Um, you know. Uh, they gave it to us, I think, for free eventually, but there's, um, there was a lot of discussion about how difficult it was to go into their system and, uh, and get it out. But in fact, it's actually just one keystroke. So we got all the scores that were um, assigned in 2013 and 2014. So that's 18,000 defendants who were scored by Compass uh, in that two-year period. So the first thing we did was took a look at just straight up look at the data. And look, okay, is it biased? So on the left is black defendant scores and on the right is white defendant scores. So the first thing you see right away is this is a one through 10 scale with 10 being the highest risk. So what you see right away is that white defendants are getting a lot of really low risk scores and the black defendant scores are pretty evenly distributed throughout them. So of course I was tempted to write a story right then and there saying, okay, it's biased. But of course, that's not necessarily true. Because what if every one of those white defendants was Mother Teresa and they actually were the lowest risk people ever, right? That it could be incredibly accurate. So I had the sad realization that we had to look up the criminal records of every one of those 18,000 people, which we did and it sucked. <laughs> but we scraped this uh, site for everyone's criminal record and we got um, everyone's priors and uh, their future recidivism because might as well get it to see whether the score actually accurately predicted whether they went on to commit a crime. The future of the risk of recidivism score, which is the one we looked at, um, is intended to judge whether you'll commit another crime in the next two years, a new offense. And so we looked for the next two years whether people had committed a crime. Obviously we're moving from the data the time that they were incarcerated so that it was actually two years worth of days. 
Um, so essentially, at the end of all that, we were able to do a reg regression and show that actually when you had a simil two similar defendants, black and white, with same priors, same age and gender, and same future recidivism, that the black defendant was 45% more likely to get a higher risk score. And so that was a sort of clear result about how it did actually overscore black defendants. And the way to understand that is probably more clear in the false positive and the false negative rates. And so um, false positive meaning you didn't go on to commit a new crime, but you were scored high risk, so it was falsely positive about your risk. Um, in that area, black defendants uh, were scored incorrectly 45% of the time and whites 23% of the time. So blacks were twice as likely to get a false positive. And similarly, false negatives, meaning you were scored low risk, but you actually did go on to commit a crime. It was the opposite. So whites were twice as likely to get a low risk score, but it was unjustified. What that looks like is, on the ground, two people arrested for the same thing. So here we have Vernon Prater and Brescia Borden. They were both arrested for petty theft, both still about $80 worth of goods. Um, just as a technical detail, Brescia was walking by a house, saw a kid's bicycle in the front yard, tried to ride it. When the mother came and asked her for it back, she gave it back. But the neighbor had already called the police. So it was technically a theft, but the property was returned. Uh, but to Fort Lauderdale police, that didn't matter. She was arrested and booked, spent two days in jail, and she was given a high risk score. She was 18 years old. Um, Vernon was arrested for stealing $80 worth of um, shoplifting from a drugstore. And he had actually three armed robberies in his past, including a five year prison stay, and he was given a low risk score. So, what happened? Were those scores right? No. Vernon went on to rob a warehouse of $1,000 worth of electronics, and he's serving a nine-year sentence right now. And Brescia hasn't done anything since then. So just as a one of the many data points that we found in our uh, 18,000 set was cases like this, where comparable crimes, different scores, and you can see that it does seem slightly biased towards African-American defendants, which is what we found in our regression. Now, it's worth pointing out, though, that the algorithm is equally predictive for black and white defendants. So it's 60% accurate for both black and white defendants. So this is what the founders of the score came back and said, you're not fair to us because everyone has the same chance of being right. The problem is everyone doesn't have the same chance of being wrong, right? The way it's wrong is different. But this predictive accuracy is the standard by which most criminal risk scores are judged right now. And many, in many of the studies that I've read of all the different scores really only focus on the accuracy rates. And this is literally a debate that's happening in the criminal justice system right now. So a lot of people have come out criticizing our score saying failure rates don't matter. You're looking at a just, it's a side effect of getting the same level of accuracy. I think that's a philosophical debate, honestly we think failure rates matter, because if you're the person who got overscored and you have a high risk score that's unjustified, it matters to you. But if you're the s judge and you want to feel like I've just done a 60% accurate on both sides, you feel that you're unbiased. So it's a matter of your perspective, I think. Um, I would also point out that 60% is not a great accuracy rate. I would actually be fired if I had a 60% accuracy rate. Also, the violent recidivism score was only 20% accurate. So that is um, something that I think is pretty hard to defend. Uh, and, I, and it's worth pointing out that um, the company doesn't do, didn't ana analyze its own violent recidivism score in any of its own white papers or in its defense. So, um, it, and also worth pointing out that it used to be that um, psychologists were brought in to assess whether somebody was a violent, likely to be violent in the future. And, they were thrown out of this process when it was proven, I think in the 80s, that they only had a 53% accuracy rate for predicting violence. So I feel like 20% is a step backwards. Um, I guess you can't see it, but this is a picture of a guy, Paul Zilly. So these con scores have consequences. This is a guy in Wisconsin. He stole a push lawnmower to fuel his meth habit, and he had a long history of petty thefts for his meth um, problems. And when the, we went to court, um, the, his prosecutor and his lawyer had come to a plea deal for a one year in jail and some drug treatment. 
And the judge said, well, but actually, I see this risk of violence really high for you. So I'm overturning the plea deal, and I'm giving you three years in prison. He fought it and eventually got six months taken off of that prison sentence after the founder of Compass, which is the score was used to, to, um, to judge him, testified that he had actually never meant for this score to be used in sentencing. So the debate continues, though, in Wisconsin. There's been a recent Supreme Court ruling about the use of Compass at sentencing. Another guy had uh, also um, disputed his score. And the court ruled just in June, I believe, that, um, yeah, there might be some weird news reports from like ProPublica about how it might be biased. But in fact, you know, you shouldn't be using them for negative things, only use it for positive things. So basically, when you look at a score, just think of it in terms of like, does this person need drug treatment, but not whether they should go and be penalized with some longer sentence. And there's supposed to be a warning label basically with the score, like, you know, kind of like on your mattress, like don't light this on fire, or like don't use this um, for bad things. And, you know, the problem with my thinking about that is that, you know, by not giving someone a good thing, you are giving them a bad thing. So if you're choosing to the score for who's gonna get some treatment, which as we all know, treatment is still a scarce resource, it is, going to be punitive to the people who don't get it. So I'm not sure that that sort of warning label truly describes what will be happening on the ground. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's been a huge amount of debate about our analysis and whether it was fair. So this is an article by um, a bunch of academics who said that our false positives, false negatives, and false analyses. And so basically their point is false positives and false negatives don't matter. We have predictive accuracy, and that is what we're looking for. And that is fair. And so it's really a debate about what is the meaning of fairness. And I actually feel like I don't need to take a position on this. I think that we pointed out something that the industry wasn't discussing before, right? No one was actually talking about false positives and false negatives before. And if we all as a society want to come together and decide that that is just like okay and we're okay with that kind of disparity, uh, it's a policy debate. But it's not, but it's what is wrong to me is the fact that it wasn't ever discussed or analyzed or looked at before. Um, and after I, uh, we did this, we've been doing a series of articles about algorithms. Um, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times sort of asking the question of how can we hold algorithms accountable? Because one question is, even if this algorithm was perfectly fair, if Compass was perfect, had no bias, there's still a question of how do you go into court and dispute it? Like, what's your rights about, like, I'm a seven, not a five, right? How do you have that fight? What's the due process that we can offer people if they're being scored? And so I think that's a very important debate about what is the right way to hold algorithms accountable. And I do think that offering people redress and ability to dispute is what we have considered due process to be in the past. And I hope that we can find ways to hold algorithms, not just the criminal risk scores, accountable in the same way. Um, and just a few lessons that I learned from doing this was that, you know, one thing I noticed with the criminal risk scores in general was that there was very little independent testing of them. Most scores that I looked at, including Compass, was, they, it was a white paper when they were announced, and then many jurisdictions would do their own validation after they bought it. So they're already kind of justifying their purchase, and in many cases, not at all timely analysis. So Wisconsin has been using Compass throughout its pinball system since 2010, but they have not yet done an analysis. New York State has been using Compass um, since 2001, and they published their validation study in 2012. It didn't examine racial bias, didn't ask the question. And so I think that it's important for there to be independent testing. You know, it doesn't have to be necessarily me, because that took me uh, like more than a year, <laughs> and I can't do it again. Um, but I hope that a field emerges that will analyze these scores independently because they need to be examined outside of just the people who purchased them and who have a vested interest in them. Another thing is that people say, oh, well, you can just, if we have transparency, if we can see the formulas. The Compass formula is a trade secret, but the night before we published, Compass said, okay, look, Julia, you can just see it, but don't tell anyone. So I can't tell you what I saw, but I will just tell you I saw a bunch of math, <laughs> and if I looked at that, there's no way I would be able to tell if it was biased. It's 
an equation with certain weights on certain variables. And the really, the way to analyze it is to look at the outcome. And so that's the way that we were able to understand what it was doing, not the actual math equation itself. And I would just like to point out that I'm not math illiterate. I have a math degree, <laughs> so I'm not saying it's like an impossible equation, it's just impossible to foretell what its results would be. And finally, the question of due process, I think, is the most important one, which is how do we provide due process protections with something so important as something that like determines whether you're gonna be incarcerated or not. Um, and so here's all our links. You can't see any of them, but they're all on ProPublica. We have published our methodology. We gave out all of our data. We have a technical response to North Point's objections. And we try to be extremely transparent in everything we do. So um, I hope that this analysis helps bring more conversation into the question of how best to use data in the criminal justice system. Thank you.